broken dreams Like broken bodies under pale street lights Tonight I seen the hate, yeah I heard their lies I turned my back and now I'm on the outside Well, here we are. Learn to get it situated first before I start yapping. Don't want to repeat of the catastrophe at the start of last week's episode. Hello there, fellow dudes, damsels, dandies, and dashing dastards with a delirious, deranged desire for demonic daring do like myself. Welcome to another episode of White Trash Rob's Nodcast. Um... I just did a whole fucking 45-minute spiel that I lost due to technical bullshit that's beyond my neo-Luddite's understanding and capability to fathom. Um, I lost it. It went nowhere. And the light was blinking. It had something to do with the memory card tricking itself into thinking it was full, and I'm stopping there. I'm not going to fucking bore you. So, here we are. Um, obviously, strangely, my mood is better. I was in a suck fucking mood um, doing the first the first time I did this. Um, after a week of suck fucking mood, the reason this one's late, and I apologize for that. You guys know my feelings on being late with these things. I don't like it. It doesn't happen that often. But, uh, bipolar is bipolar, and I fucking last, uh, I had insomnia for about four or five days over the weekend, and then I crashed for like two days straight. Since I woke up, I have been mixing the new Ramallah, uh, uh, at least not personally mixing, I've been listening back to mixes. Ain't that exciting? It's fucking, it's, I can almost taste it. It's, it's almost here. And enshrined in this new Ramallah is the surprise I've been dangling in all your faces for lo this past year or so. The big fucking surprise. What is it? I don't know. I have to wait and see, right? But uh, I'm actually in a better mood. Uh, when I woke up after my marathon sleep session, after my marathon insomnia session, um, the house was nearly burned down. There were strange and explicable hoof prints of activity around the house. My Deirdre was screaming at me that there were like cigarettes all over the floor and like potato chips up on the shelves and shit like that. I don't know. I, I might have done it. I might not have. I don't know. But when I woke up from my Rip Van Winkle's summer nap, um, I looked like such shit that I was actually contemplating just jumping on the camera so you could see what I look like at my worst. When it's, when it's like, 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 you know, uh, almost time to be sectioned, Rob. 
Um, I came out of the room and she's like, Jesus, you look like shit. And I was like, really? What do I look like? She's like, you look like Rick Astley. I was like, that's not so bad. She's like, if he was dead for two weeks. I was like, that's, that's kind of bad. And I went in the bathroom and sure enough, I looked like Rick Astley if somebody had left him in a land, left his corpse in a landfill for like two weeks. Or I looked like Lyle Levitt, not Lyle Levitt looks now. Um, and he's still alive. Poor guy. Can you believe he used to bang Cynthia Crawford? Is it Cynthia Crawford? No, Julia Roberts. She like married him after meeting him for like two, she met him and like two weeks later she married that guy. That guy, that guy, this is an outrage. That dude's fucking scary. Anyways, maybe he's a really good conversationalist. Um, this week, I'm gonna fulfill my promise to answer the viewer questions that I thought I was gonna do that I said in the last thing of these this with the camera and the yappity yap don't talk back take out the papers in the trash oh am I feeling manic now I don't know maybe a little shit I gotta feel a little better I felt like shit for about a week for no fucking reason and believe me I am aware that there is often no reason for it and that there are many others out there with infinitely worse to deal with than I but there's nothing logical about bipolar it is malfunctioning hardware um, and have the most powerful computer in the world but if there's some virus in there you're fucked so viewer questions and maybe a bit of a swerve into story time territory let's get to it shall we oh and um Shout out to Jack Shattuck. Thank you for having me to your shindig. Um, was it Saturday or Sunday? I don't remember. That was right in the middle of my insomnia stretch. Uh, but it was a great time. Um, shout out to Colin of Arabia. I'm glad you got out of the can. Um, it was fucking great seeing you, brother. Um, you seem to be in a really good fucking place. Uh, it was great talking to you. It was great seeing all the other brothers at uh, Jack shindig. It was great seeing brother Brophy. Uh... Brother Mandel, Danny, um, Brother Dewey, um, and everybody else. It was a really, really good time. My brother Mark made an appearance. You, you want to talk about, like, Bigfoot and Sasquatch? No, Bigfoot and, like, Skunk Ape being seen at the same lawn party. Me and my brother. Can you fucking believe that? That's, like, the Loch Ness Monster and, like, Ogopogo. Is that what the, the plesiosaur from down in Brazil? I'm losing it. I'm losing it. What do you want? I just fucking did this and lost it. I'm fucking pissed. If you have questions, here we go. Maybe a bit of story time. We'll fucking see. Uh, are you planning on using any... Uh, from James Kaysen. From James Kaysen. Are you planning on using any blood for who riffs or songs you may have written in either Ramallah? Uh, in either Ramallah or the new band you were talking about forming with Ian? As far as the new band, I'm talking, to Foreman with, talking about Foreman with Ian, we're going for something totally different with that. Uh, we want to go for something fucking straight brutal. Uh, straight discharge meets fucking His Hero's Gone meets tragedy. Like something just straight ahead blitz. Apocalyptic core. Um, as far as using any Blood for Blood songs with Ramallah, stay tuned. Told you there's a surprise coming. Um, to be revealed when it's time for it to be revealed. Uh, let's see. Uh, Sean McQuinnon. Sean McQuinnon asks. Sean McKinnon asks. This question is an oldie, but I always wondered why Capital Punishment was never released on an album. Um, and then... Let's just say there's a reason I took over writing all the lyrics. Um, that song has chased us around, chased us around the way Master Race has sort of shadowed Biohazard their whole career. Um, I like the music. I wrote, I wrote the music, but um, that was before that. Was, I didn't write the lyrics to that song, and it was a primary, if not sole, reason for me taking over. All lyric writing. The lyrics to that song 
Sock. Um, cool little hardcore song, but I, I look with me. I ain't answering for nobody else. I will answer only for me, but I will answer for me. With, with me, you, what you see is what you get. Um, I lay it all on the table, but I got to be able to answer for it. I won't answer for anybody else. Um, I'm not answering for that fucking song. And there's a reason I took over all the lyric writing. Now, it's not the only reason, but it, it, it certainly factored. Um, so do me a favor and forget that song exists. All is. Thank you. Um, I, we were fucking 14 when we wrote it, for Christ's sakes. I mean, I'm not even blaming the other guy for fucking writing the lyrics. I mean, we were kids. But um, either way, lyrics suck. I learned I better write these fucking things. Because then I can answer for them. Because I ain't answering for that fucking song. I'll tell you what. Uh, Joe Balgum asks... I remember back when you had a website, you listed top 10 most embarrassing drunken moments. Um, I wouldn't mind hearing back any of the stories of, uh, hearing back the stories of any of those. Regardless, find the Nordcast great and enjoy watching it. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I remember that list. Um, as you said, one of them being you driving a friend's car and grinding into several parked cars. Well, that's not one of the ones that made the list. I did that a bunch of times. I used to always veer into park traffic whenever I drove. It was a consistent theme of my um, auto automotive career. career. But um, I uh, one of the it was ba I basically had a top ten list of uh, the the stupidest things I had done while drunk, and it was would change from week to week. But like um, almost inexplicable things, et cetera, et cetera. And this was back in my early to mid twenties when the shit that the crazy shit that happened as a result of my drinking and drug use was actually still kind of funny and not like life changing and, and, and horrendous. Um, I, like one of them was I, I drank my, my brother's sea monkeys, my brother Patrick's sea monkeys in a drunken stupor. I had passed out in his bed. And um, you know how you wake up with a fucking hangover and you need, you, you wake up dreaming of like ice cold soda? Like did that and I fumbled around at the end table in the dark and I gulped down this big plastic cup of fucking fluid but there was like floaties in it and like like scum it was like stuff in it and when i woke up in the morning and sea monkeys were gone i had drank his little pet sea monkeys and i think about those sea monkeys sometimes because if they're still alive i think of, i wonder if they like got a little colony going in my intestines my stomach and my intestines the shit i put those poor sea monkeys through with the stuff i put in my body to get them all fucking dependent on alcohol and drugs and then they just quit those sea monkeys are probably having fucking AA meetings in my fucking intestines right now. Poor sea monkeys having AA and NA meetings in my ass. Um, another one was um, I woke up one day after a three-day drunken bender. And the entire first chapter of Moby Dick, starting with Call Me Ishmael, was written on one of my walls in Heinz Green Ketchup. Now, here's the problem with that. Um, I'm, I'm a... I'm a literate guy, if not a literary guy, literary guy. Uh, I've certainly read Moby Dick, but it wasn't in my handwriting. And I don't own any Heinz green ketchup, nor have I ever. So, you know, I guess it's as good as mine. But the story he referred to about grinding the pot cars, that had happened a bunch of times when I drove drunk. No, the story that made the top ten list was infinitely fucking worse. Got in much more trouble. I um, was drinking at the Rat at a fucking Sunday matinee. I've been drinking all day, and my girl had been too, my girlfriend at the time, and she got obliterated, and she was also on codeine that week because she had pneumonia, and the pneumonia didn't make it any better either, so she was legless. I mean, she was fucking out cold, or at best, superly conscious. So, at the end of the show, she's like barfing all over the place, falling down, making a spectacle out of herself, and uh, I threw her in the car, and I had one of those, mo I, I had been drinking all day, but like one beer an hour. Um, I wasn't even remotely drunk. I had no warm sense of well-being. I didn't feel good. I was just in a miserable fucking mood. I was like, fuck, I don't want to go through all this shit. She had to get to work the next morning at like 5 in the morning. I was like, fuck, I'll just drive all the way up to Com I'll just shoot up Calm Ave to Austin, where my house was, behind the big burrito. And it'll be done. I can do that. I'm not hammered. Well, I slid through a red light that seemed to go red at the last second. Didn't seem to be yellow. And I crashed into a car, car load of yuppies. I spun them out. Whoop, 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 whoop. And uh, I got out of the car and I made sure they were all right. The driver of the car looked like fucking John Lithgow. Some yuppie guy, professor, professorial guy. He was 
waving a hunk of his own car that had fallen off at me and beating it against my girl's car's uh, hood and flipping out and threatening to kill me. I made sure everybody was all right because I wasn't going to leave anybody injured. Um, and he's threatening to kill me. I'm going to fucking kill you. He was having a fit. I mean, this guy was irate. He was having a conniption, a hissy fit of epic proportions. And he's waving the bar in my face and blah, blah, blah. So my girl from inside the car goes, hey, from her soupy state of conscience, and hands across the seat, hands me a cue ball and a bandana to clock this guy on the forehead, grant him a wish like a genie. Ding! Out to you, JJ Genie. And uh, I had a burst of temporary sanity and said to myself, I always had a rule, don't fight at the behest of a drunk girl, a drunk broad. I've seen so many guys get their skulls crushed because they fought because of some drunken chick. Yep, yappity yep. Fucking out, you fuck, kill him. So I adhered to my own rule, had a burst of temporary sanity, and I threw the cue ball under the seat. And thank God I did. Um, as you'll see in a second, I talked John Lithgow with the piece of his car that he was waving at me. I talked them into pulling over to exchange information. I blew the red light. The reason it was extremely fortuitous that I did not crack that yuppie in the head with that cue ball was because behind me the whole time watching all this from the start was an undercover state trooper detective. So after I blew the red light, within 15 minutes, I have half of BPD and half of the Massachusetts State Police following me. There's nine of them. They got the chopper on me. I took them on an hour and a half tour of Alston, Brookline, and everywhere in between. They ended up catching me at the Mass Pike State Tolls. I was taking Batman fucking lefts, having to stick my arm out of the fucking car to grab telephone poles to give me the leverage to cut these shop turns. They got me at the Mass Pike State Tolls, guns to the head, dragged me to the ground, roughed me up a little bit. Uh, a lot of knees, a lot of elbows, a lot of spears. And uh, there was really nothing funny about that. Uh, but that's what actually happened. The skidding into parked cars was just something I did pretty regularly when I drove. I wasn't a good driver, when you want me to say. All right, um, moving on. Uh, Ed Sherman asks, have you thought about doing a solo acoustic covers album? Yes, I have. Uh, but I would like to get, uh, I've been gone a long time and I want to get back into the swing of my major projects first. There's a lot to reclaim and I got a lot to prove because I've been gone so long and like I said, I don't expect anybody to take my word for it. So I'm going to do all the music that I got to get out. But eventually I would like to do an acoustic album because I like doing those kinds of songs. It's I mostly playing acoustic guitar around here. I'm not in my house yelling 25 to life songs. Um, I, I mostly do melodic shit with the uh, Akui if I'm going to do something to please myself. So yeah, I would like to do an album like that. And with having the ability to record now, now that we got the home studio, I will have the opportunity to do that, you know, provided I don't get hit by a bolt of lightning or a meteor or something like that, which is entirely possible with my karma. But um, yeah, the answer is yes, I would like to do that. But I got a lot of other stuff to do first. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Will the new Blood for Blood ever be released? If you mean that lost album that was going to be released the weekend of the Wasted Night shows that were canceled in ignominy. Is that how you say that? Ignominious? Um, I don't know. Uh, will new Blood for Blood songs ever... So, uh, will Blood for... Uh, unrecorded Blood for Blood songs? The Blood for Blood songs that could have been? Will they ever come out? Stay tuned. Surprise. Um, that was by Stu... VSXE BJJ. Um, and once again, Man of the Hour. Oh, uh, No Faith in Humanity. Twinfold asks, do you plan to work with Ian on Bass Again or Recordings Alive? Uh, short answer is yes. Um, Ian and I have discussed a lot of different possibilities, uh, a lot of different options, and we do have some plans. Like I said, the, the, the project we're planning right now, um, that has nothing to do with Blood for Blood. If I name the other people involved, um, there would be some buzz about it. But um, uh, I'll wait till we got something happening. I, I, I hate that to drop something that, and then it doesn't happen for two years, which is the story of my life. So last, I got to check something real quick. Hang on. All right. So lastly, Jack Shattuck asks, man of the hour, Jack. 
How about a crazy BFB Ramal tour experience? I could use a chuckle to stop a semester. And Cody D had asked, tell us the story of the midget in Barcelona. From the back from the land of Nod, back from the black. Um, take another piece of my heart, Ramala song from the EP, The Split with Sinners and Saints, the lead off track. Um, so I will tell that story because it was a trippy one. That was a trippy fucking day. Let me tell you what. And this falls sort of under the, the heading of story time. I'm going to try to make this quick because I'm running out of fucking time. Um, I, we had, I was on that last tour with Ramallah in Europe before I came back to Boston and cleaned up. I was strung out. I was crashing and burning. So we got to Barcelona and I was dope sick as fuck. I was about three days dope sick. Really fucking sick. So, um, I, of course, ran right. We got to, the, got to the club about noon. I ran, but I was ex ecstatic, or at least optimistic, because I'd heard Barcelona was a big fucking dope town, big supporters of the H-bomb and all of its sundry stuff. So, um, I went right up to the promoter and said, is there a train station near here? He said, no, not really. I said, are there any areas near here where if I went there, I would likely be killed? And he said, yes. I said, give me directions to them. He said, why do you want to go there? I was like, I need to buy something. He's like, what, cocaine? I get you cocaine. I was like, no, I need the other stuff. He's like, what, ecstasy? I'm like, I always hated spitting out. I'm like, heroin. It's like everybody in the room, the jukebox, I go, Ooh, what a loser. Rightly so. Um, so he sent me to Peter Station. He said, it's not near here, but he sent me to Peter Station. I, I remember that specifically. So I jumped in a cab. I found out after I left, he went to my guys, the rest of my band, and said, you are likely to never see a singer again. And they were like, why? And they're like, I just, he asked me for, to send him to get uh, heroin. I could only send him to the mafia, or I could send him to the gypsies. I sent him to the gypsies. If I send him to the mafia, 100% chance he don't come back. If I send him to the gypsy, about 50% 50 50 chance, 75% chance he don't come back. So you may never see him again. And the rest of our guys were like, he does this every day. It'll either be all right or he won't, but this is not news. So, um, it was fucking crazy. Uh, it was this big industrial fucking area. We kept driving around the station. I could see it like 500 yards away. I could see the station, but I was in the cab. We kept going around and around and around and around. It was in the middle of construction, so it was in the middle of this blasted fucking uh, leveled rubble fucking zone with like uh, the foundations of like old buildings and stuff and basements, uh, these big fields of like half leveled stuff. They were in the middle of building roads to the new PETA station. So we're going around and around. I started eating into my drug money because the cab fare got up to like $50. I'm sick as a dog. I'm dying. I can't sit there and handle this. So I kept saying, let me out, let me out. The cab driver was like, no, 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 we find it. Finally, I waited for him to slow down. I threw the money at him and jumped out and fucking did like a half roll and Walked to the station. The minute I got to the station, I saw uh, a homeless-looking guy, uh, leather jacket with, like, a bandana. He looked like a burnt-out hippie-type guy. And I said, drogas? And he said uh, something, something, probably asking me what kind. And I went like this, and he was like, saddle up. So we, started, we left the station, which was beautiful, by the way. In the middle of all this rubble and desolation, the station was, like, mint, brand new. We started walking up the tracks. We walked for fucking miles. I shit you not. I know I was sick. But we walked for miles, like at least three miles up these tracks. No trains coming. I kept saying, donde, donde, because it's some of, the, some of the only Spanish I know. Where, where, and he keeps going, vamanos, vamanos. We are in the middle of fucking nowhere. On either side, there's nothing, for as far as the eye can see, to the horizon. You can barely see the city, like just the silhouette of the city, at like the way edges, like the event horizon of the fucking scene. You can barely see the silhouette. We are like out in the middle of nowhere, following this track into nowhere. Finally, after a bunch of miles, he takes a left out of nowhere. We go way down the steep slope into this garbage field that's like miles fucking wide. Stinks like shit. There's a reason for that I find out in a minute. Now, I'm so fucking dope sick that I think I'm hallucinating because the ground of this rubble pit, which is just all fucking trash and shit and fucking mud and pools of what smells like horse piss or cow piss, turns out it's human piss, um, it's shimmering. It's waving like this. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? I, 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 I think I'm tripping. I'm like, have I finally had a reality break? No. It was massive herds of rats running as one that was making the ground look like it was shimmering. So we, and the piles of trash were sometimes up to our heads. So we're picking our way through this for another mile. And out of the dock, like a, like a medieval military camp, I see fire beacons start to come out of the dock, like 
sentry fires. And it turns out that's exactly what they were. We approach one of the fire barrels, and there's like 20 guys around it. And they see the guy I'm following first, and they whip around, and they see him, and he waves. They wave back to him. And when I get into the light, they whip around, and they all pull out fucking shanks. They all pull out shivs and start yelling at me like, it's, you know, I, I don't know what they're, they're speaking Spanish, but obviously saying, what the fuck are you doing here? And I just went, drogas? And they immediately were like, oh, oh, ah, vamanos, vamanos. So I pass the sentries, and I get into a tiny little village in the middle of nowhere. It's all trailers, and they got streets, generators, power lines strung up, uh, Christmas lights for, like, street lights strung across the streets. It's a tiny little gypsy village in the middle of fucking nowhere. I'm nervous as fuck because the, the guys were really hostile until they saw that they could do anything they wanted to me out there. We are in the middle of fucking nowhere, surrounded by a trash pit. They could have buried me, etc. So I'm tripping face. I'm sick as a dog. I'm falling apart. I am literally a mess. We get to the door. I've seen the rats waving, the guys with the knives. I'm like, I can't take this. I can't take this. We finally go pick one of the, go up to one of the trailers. The guy knocks on the door. The door opens, and it's a midget in a Metallica shirt staring in my eyeballs. The door opens, and I, I see this guy looking at me. I was just like, holy fuck. I'm not here right now. I'm finally in an asylum somewhere, and I'm just imagining all this. So they let me in. After the guy has quick words, I pay him his money. He takes off, leave me with the gypsy. He, in a damaged incorporated shirt, a midget, he leads me into the house to his mother on a couch. His mother weighs 500 pounds, and her face is covered with these huge moles that are bigger than fucking hostess snowballs. I feel like I'm in an episode of Carnival. And I'm fumbling for the word for heroin, which is caballo in Spanish. It means horse. I'm saying like caballeros, caballeros. I couldn't remember the word, which means like cowboys or something like that. So they don't know exactly what I want. So they go like, they do the, the universal gesture. And I said, CCC, see, 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 but I went, needlessly complicated my life. I went, because I was thinking I might sniff it there. I'm thinking, I, I got to get high because I'm so sick I can barely stand up. But I don't think, I don't know if they're going to let me cook up or shoot up there. So I, I complicate my life by going sniff, sniff. So they go, oh! And they lay out, I give them the 200 euro or whatever. They lay out like two grams on a mirror for me. And under the blinking generator Christmas lights, and with the sensory distortion of me being so sick and breathless and weak, it looks kind of brown, but it also looks kind of yellowish. Now, dope is not yellowish, but it can be white, and it can be light brown, and it can be tan, and it can be black if it's black tie heroin. So in the song, I said I snorted it. Um, because at the time I wrote those lyrics, I was still hiding from my family that I had actually gotten into um, intravenous injection. Um, the truth is, I loaded up about half of this stuff, about a gram's worth of this powder, and blasted it. All in one shot. It was not heroin. It was yellow flake cocaine. Like the really good Colombian stuff that's like flaky and fluffy. Um, I never do coke. I never do coke. I went from never doing coke to blasting intravenously a gram of it. That's all I can say. Woo! Um, throat closed up. Like a butthole. Fireball went up my whole body. I started tearing off all of my clothes. They're now angry at me because they're probably assuming they're going to have to bury my corpse. And that would be a really dirty job in that cesspit surrounding this whole area. Um, they're like yelling at me while I'm tearing off my clothes, kneeling in front of them in my boxers, trying to breathe. <gasps> My hog hanging out, my little shriveled from coke, fucking hog. And uh, I go, okay, 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 pointing at the powder. And they're like, coca, coca, coca. Like, you wanted coca. And I was like, no, 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 caballero. Like, caballo? I'm like, see, see, see. And they're like, oh. So they go and get a browner bag and lay out a big spoonful just to get me the fuck out of there. So it's all mixed in with the, the remainder of the coke. But I gotta get some dope in me at this point, if only to stave off heart attack from the massive amount of cocaine I just injected. So I bury my nose in the fucker and just go <laughs> snuff it all up. They shove me the fuck out into the mud shit ground out there. I'm carrying my clothes, I'm in my boxes. As I leave, the sentries are just like watching me like, 
they don't even say nothing to me. I think they are a little nervous and scared at that point. Uh, it took me hours to get back to the motherfucking show because no cabs would pick me up, and I thought they were being dicks until I realized I was still naked trying to get the cabs. It was an eventful day. Uh, I don't remember that show at all, but I do remember that for like the next five hours, it felt like I was walking four feet above my own feet. I felt like I was walking on fucking nothing. So I hope that little story made you chuckle. It's a true story, and I wrote it into the lyrics of that Back From the Black song on the split 7-inch, uh, split 10-inch with Sinners and Saints, my other band. Check it out. I think there's still like 30 or 40 copies of that left. Uh, this has been an episode of White Trash Rob's Nodcast. See you all next week, back on the regular schedule. Maybe answer some more of these. There's still a few more. I just picked these out randomly. Love you all. See you later, guy.